So let me uh, give you a quick introduction on Rajiv. Rajiv has been associated uh, with NEN, that is needless to say. And uh, he has been an entrepreneur turned educator. And right now, Rajiv is uh, associated with XLRI Jamshedpur. And he's uh, been a CEO for Niladri Enterprises and Mile Solutions and 36 Inc. So there's a lot that we can run, learn from Rajiv. And uh, I think I will hand it over to Rajiv now. Rajiv, we can't hear you. You need to unmute yourself. <laughs> yeah. Please go. Half our lives now are uh, either on Zoom or some such thing. So uh, thank you, Vijay. Thank you for this very generous uh, introduction. And uh, very glad to meet all of you here. And uh, good to have you on board and good to have you here for this session. Um, and uh, thank you, Vanji, from uh, Philippines. Um, good that we are meeting over here. Uh, hope we can someday, very soon, when all these things are over, we can also have a decent offline meeting also. Good to see you all over here. So uh, um, the way we're going to do it, I have a very short presentation. I'm going to present a few ideas uh, which are uh, around customer and how do you actually under end up understanding your customer very well. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please ask away. I'll uh, interrupt my presentation and then we can um, uh, attend to the questions and then get back to the presentation again. And if you think that it might be something that I might be addressing in the next half of the presentation or the next few minutes of the presentation, then I think just hold on till the end of the presentation. I'll have a lot of time left over for questions and answers. So just don't worry about that. And um, so we can get started right now. Okay, so broadly about understanding my customer and uh, my perspective on entrepreneurship has been that one of the biggest things you bring to the table as an entrepreneur is your empathy, your ability to put yourself in the shoes of the person sitting across the table from you and think from the other person's point of view, uh, think, feel from the other person's point of view is probably one of the biggest assets that an entrepreneur has in their arsenal. It not only allows you to be uh, very true to what you're doing, but it also adds a lot of value to the enterprise itself that you're running. Now, uh, just a brief background in terms of me, I carry all these hats and I carry all these hats simultaneously. I am an entrepreneur. I continue being an entrepreneur. I never can think of myself as anything but an entrepreneur. I am a full-time faculty member. I'm a prof at uh, XLRI, which is a management school probably the oldest in Asia. And uh, then uh, I'm a CEO of an incubator, the campus incubator. We have uh, right now two um, campuses, one in Delhi and one in uh, Jamshedpur, which is in Eastern India. So two campuses in the country. And I'm also an investor. I have uh, been investing in startups since the last 15 years. And uh, I have uh, investments in a lot of my student startups for sure, and also in the general startups which uh, from the ecosystem itself. Um, I'm a member of some of the startup, uh, the startup investment communities which uh, are probably driving uh, startup investment in India, uh, early stage startup investment in India more than in uh, the large scale VCs and all. And I do mentor a lot of enterprises. So as you can see, uh, I can't escape being sort of empathetic. I'm on all sides of the equation. I end up being everywhere. A little bit of everything is what I end up doing. So what I'm going to talk about over here is about customer and I'm going to give you three perspectives. First of all, let's look at customers and their buying habits. Um, so this is, any one of you recognize this car? It has it has been sold across the world with various brand names. So I want to see if any of you recognize any of the names that it has been sold by. Anyone? Yeah, people say Reva. A lot of people okay. saying Reva Nano on the chat window. Okay, okay. I think yes. Now I get in the chat window, yes. 
so yeah so reva is the name that it usually used to go by so reva is uh, a car which is produced in india uh, it sold under a different brand in the uk and it sold in uh, yet another brand in japan and it was the largest selling car in all these three countries and across the world also it was the largest selling electric car in the world at its time but this entire sales that the largest selling car i'm talking about it amounted to about 10000 pieces in a year and 10000 pieces in a year is nothing i mean it, uh, i think detroit churns out that kind of uh, number from each of the factories every day probably and uh, i can think of 10 15 uh, car companies across the world who do that volume uh, easily do that volume in less than a week or probably on a daily basis so it wasn't selling all that much so why wasn't it selling all that much any thoughts yes lanan it was small uh, I'm a little, um, I'm a little tallish. I'm about six feet three. So for me to get into that car was a huge problem. And any of the big guys, we just couldn't get into this car. It was a tight fit to the highest extent. Uh, other thing was, of course, um, the capacity. Capacity was low. If you were carrying two pieces of luggage, you are down. You you really will not be able to uh, do justice to uh, your luggage. Price, yes, Neha. I think the price was uh, probably comparable to what you would pay for any other small uh, hatchback, but it was slightly uh, getting skewed when you had to change the batteries every uh, few years. Um, it was a bit ahead of its time, yes. Uh, it was not uh, uh, best for off-road, certainly. I don't think anybody would want to go off-road in this. That sounds like a challenge over here. Another thing, again, is the kind of range it had. You know, you go for about 60 kilometers and then you run out of battery. So you need a, a connection over there. Another important thing was the speed. It had the high speed of 40 kmph. I know most of us live in countries where if you're going 40 kmph, you're doing very well. I mean, it's very rarely that you'll be able to hit 40 kmph on the kind of highways we end up doing. But you want the option of going at 200 kmph and getting caught by the policeman if you are going, to, if ever, right? So um, maintenance was actually one of the better things. Uh, it, it wasn't that much of a problem because, uh, you, you know, it is an electric car. It has fewer moving parts. So maintenance wise, it was reasonably fine. But, you know, this was the car from the seller's point of view or rather this seller's point of view was something that you use for getting from point A to point B as a personal mode of transport. I don't think customers looked at it that, that way. Let's look at the car which ultimately ended up being successful uh, as a electric car. All of us have obviously heard about the Tesla. The Tesla was launched at a price of 80,000 euros uh, or in, in about $90,000. And it went on to becoming a huge success in the first model it launched itself. It had a high sticker price, which is something like uh, 10 times the price what the Riva was trying to sell for. But people didn't have a problem with price over there. This was more the kind of car that they really wanted to have with them than the Riva that you saw over there. Car fulfills far many more needs than just a person's um, means to go from point A to point B. And that is what Tesla addressed very, uh, very directly. Tesla knew that people wanted performance. Tesla knew that people wanted looks. So aesthetics and performance were certainly taken care of. And since then, they have rolled out a variety of cars. The Model X was um, more expensive than the first one they launched. And the latest Model S was something which brought down the price a lot. So at every price point, they have a vehicle now. Others have started learning from this and come out with products which are aesthetically pleasing. In fact, many of you may not have heard of this one. Uh, probably one of the biggest challenges that uh, Tesla has and has it in the space of the long distance trucking uh, is something called the Thor ET1. It's a beautiful looking truck, 
and it is challenging uh, Tesla in that space itself. Okay. Now, there is one particular thing that I would like to discuss right after this. Customers did not buy the car from um, Reva for a variety of reasons. Some of those reasons are going to be the switching costs. Switching costs are big. Switching costs is what prevents a lot of entrepreneurs being able to launch the product successfully. Do you know we have had products with us for a long time and uh, we have not taken it on just because of the switching costs that are, uh, that are likely to be there. For example, I mean, you, if you look at the QWERTY keyboard that we have over here, the QWERTY keyboard that I'm using, uh, that is a relic from the times where people used to use typewriters and there was a problem in making in uh, and they needed to make sure that all the keys are working uh, properly. With an electrical typewriter, electronic typewriter, we didn't have that problem. And with a computer, a PC or a laptop, we certainly don't have that problem. But we are stuck with a certain arrangement of the keys and we are happy with it. We don't want to change it. Uh, similarly, if you look at uh, any of you over here uh, follow photography as a hobby? I will just try to. Sorry, I was just trying to get this. Yes, okay, so we have Harleen, who's a photographer. She's uh, insistent that she's a photographer. Then we have Tebogo also who is into photography. Vatsal, good to see you here. And yes, you are a photographer too. And Rohan is a photographer. Um, photography as a hobby, um, what happens is um, you can buy a camera. Let us say you end up buying a camera from uh, Canon. Canon used to have some of the best products in the world and people were very happy with Canon. And over a period of time, they sort of lost their dominance in the market. Their products were really not up to it and others started catching up with them. More notably, the, product, the, the guys at Sony started catching up very well. So the uh, Sony A7 series, the A7, A7S, A7R, uh, now up to the Mark IV also, these are products which challenged, uh, so, uh, which challenged Canon products and of course Nikon also was around uh, and they had a better product. But still, there were a lot of people who found it difficult to get out of Canon and get into Sony. One was of course, they were more used to the product. DSLRs are reasonably difficult to use. There are a lot of controls. There are a lot of nuances you have in handling a, ca a camera and so they had learned how exactly to handle that piece of equipment. That was one. Other thing was uh, they had lenses, they had a lot of other accessories which went along with the camera. And if you changed, those were not compatible with the new cameras that you had. So what would end up happening is you had these, uh, you had these new products, but just because there was a far greater expense in replacing the lenses and replacing the other accessories, the, uh, uh, even the batteries and everything had to be replaced. So that became too much of a switching cost for a lot of people and they did not end up going ahead with it. Then of course, we have a lot of psychological biases uh, that, that is always there. We as human beings are likely to have biases. Uh, some of these that I would like to highlight is one is that of perceived value. Suppose we have something with us, we will end up valuing it more than if we don't have something with us. Just giving you an example, real estate, you own a house and you decide that you want to sell the house and uh, want to move somewhere else. So you will always try to sell it for more, not because you're greedy, because you really feel that your house is more, uh, worth more than the normal uh, market rate for that place. You believe there's something special about what you had and that is why it commands a market rate which is higher than what you would normally end up getting. In fact, your view of what the market rate is, is going to change if you own something that um, uh, 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 the product for which the market rate we are looking at. So the perceived value is certainly there, which is a big problem uh, for a lot of people who come up with new products. Um, 
So if there are others who are using products already, they perceive it to be of higher value than a new product that comes out in the market. Uh, then of course, there is loss aversion. So whenever you change, whenever you get onto a new product, there are things you gain and there are things you lose. So there, you are going to end up valuing the things that you lose far more than the things that you gain. A bird in the hand is what two in the bush is what it translates into. People are happier making sure that they have things with them than just trying to see what else they can end up getting. Particularly true if it is a high value purchase that you're looking at. If it's a lower value purchase, then probably not, it, uh, not as much. Lastly, entrepreneurs are optimistic. That is why they have become entrepreneurs. They believe that they can overcome a lot of things. They believe that what they have with them is actually something which is great. So uh, it becomes a little bit of a problem for them to, um, you know, to moderate what they think their product can achieve. So that becomes one of the major issues over here. Okay, now I will go on to something else, uh, which is Nish, but before I do that, any quick questions, any quick questions about what we have been discussing so far? Yes, Lakshit. Loss aversion. Okay. So let's say, for example, um, you want to end up, um, you, you have two options to go from point A to point B. You can take a train or you can take a bus. Now, each has its own advantages. Uh, let us say the bus has got um, is going to probably uh, reach you a little quicker but the train has got an advantage that you can move around a little bit so if before you have bought the ticket when you're evaluating this there's a certain way you are going to evaluate this you might have a problem i don't know whether it's worth it the fact that i can be moving around in a train and i won't be able to move around in a bus i don't know how much that is going to be worth now if you already had a ticket which uh, put you on the train, then you would say that, no, I, I don't think I want to uh, actually go by the bus now because I've already invested in the train. So whatever the train offers is going to appear to be a little better to you than what the bus would end up offering. Um, entry barrier would be for the industry. You know, for example, if there are, uh, you can say if you have certain IP, um, you have certain strong brands that prevents an enterprise from entering a particular industry. Now, suppose you are in the field of uh, fragrances, for example, or flavors, flavors and fragrances. There are about four firms in the world who dominate that market. There are four of them and they have more than 50% of the worldwide market share. So in that case, if um, uh, there are very strong entry barriers, you need to have the right kind of perfume developed. You need to have the right kind of brand. You need the, need the right kind of connections. Those are the entry barriers you have. But in the case of switching cost, it is an individual customer. So what is going to be their cost in moving from one product to another? Okay, Shivam, uh, your question is, how would I define a niche audience? It is said to become a... Uh, Exactly. So, um, yeah, I think Amazon is probably a little bit of a bad example when it comes to looking at niche audiences. Probably something like a Nika is a very good example of a niche audience, but I'll just be getting into that. Karanveer, uh, you asked me what's optimism. Okay, optimism is not the other two. When I've talked about switching cost and I've talked about psychological biases, I have talked about it from the point of view of the customer, but optimism is from the point of view of the entrepreneur. If there is an entrepreneur with a new product, they have a new mobile phone, they have a new wearable. So they would think that my product is such a marvelous product. What will happen is I'll end up selling about thousand pieces. And that is good. That is exactly what we would 
um, like the, uh, to be the mindset of the entrepreneur. But what happens is that thousand pieces is a little bit of overestimation of how many pieces they can actually end up selling. The actual sales might be actually much lesser than the thousand pieces. Um, the realistic estimate might be closer to about a 200 or a 300. So when that sale does not happen, even if it is two, 300, which is a realistic figure that actually ends up happening, the entrepreneur thinks that, oh my God, I'm not getting the kind of sales I had planned on. And probably a lot of planning would have gone in over there. Uh, the entrepreneur would have set up systems where, which were meant for a piece of, uh, for a sale of around a thousand pieces. So that would probably not do well. Okay, Kunal, I'll just hold on to that about the niche audience. I'll just get into it in uh, about two minutes. That's the next thing that I'll be discussing. How to acquire new customers who are brand loyalists in terms of switching costs. So uh, this is Mohammed Umar. Uh, so Umar, uh, what happens is there will be loyalists and it is going to be difficult to get the loyalists on board. But even those who are not diehard loyalists, it'll be difficult for you to get them on board. That the thumb rule is that if you can give 10 times the benefit, then you will be able to get people switched to what you are doing. No problem, Tombi. We will, um, I'm sure you'll have a question later. We'll, uh, we'll get to the question at a later point of time. Okay, any other, any other questions before we move on to the next bit of what we are discussing? Okay, we have uh, some other questions. How to differentiate between an idea which was, which really has demand and one for which I am just biased? You know, I think uh, this Piyush is a question which a lot of uh, entrepreneurs right now have a very common answer to. And that is that there is no way you can know for sure unless you go and start interacting with your customers. Go talk to your customers, find out if they actually want the product and then go the next step. At the least possible cost, making use of third party manufacturing, third party logistics, third party selling, platforms, marketplaces, try to get your product in front of the customer as soon as you can and then see what the reaction is. Is the customer willing to buy? If you see the customer is not willing to buy, then it becomes a chance for you to withdraw from the market and probably look at some other kind of product which has got more staying power in the market. Okay, uh, Dr. Vikas, students who have just joined the entrepreneurship course this year, very easy to motivate. Usually what used to happen uh, is that in my course of entrepreneurship, I used to end up getting about uh, good years. I'll get about 5% of the students who want to become entrepreneurs. This year, easily, I have about 35% of the students who are probably going to launch the venture in a couple of months because they see that there's a lot of uncertainty going forward and they really don't want that this time they should leave their destinies in the hands of their future employers. There are a lot more people who are thinking that now I think it's a good time to actually start launching my venture. I'll give you a case of one of my students. What happened right now was he had a nice job. His job was with a multinational consulting company and they told him that just hold on for three more months. After that, we are going to take you on. And in those three months, what he discovered was that uh, he used to be a very good piano player and he used to do online classes for piano. And there were people who were more than happy to take his classes. So he just restarted that. He said, three months, I'm going to sit, do nothing over here. So let me do one thing. Let me restart my piano classes. And suddenly he saw that it's just taking off. His YouTube channel took off. His uh, private tutoring took off. Um, question answer sessions uh, were being paid for. 
So all of this was amazing. And he started running courses on uh, various ed tech platforms, uh, YouTube itself, his channel was doing extremely well. He was actually getting money from, you, uh, from YouTube for his uh, referrals. So all that became good. And this was, and uh, he, he, I think is not going to end up joining. He was supposed to join this month. He's now delaying it. He says he wants to take his business to the next level. He will, uh, probably wants to become an affiliate marketer for piano companies. All those things are things that he has started thinking about now. Dr. Bethapuri, is it difficult to attract new customers or retain the already existing ones? Yeah, I think it's always easier to retain new, uh, retain your existing customers, and it's, there's always a higher expense in trying to attract a new one. You know. If you're going to attract a new person, it is probably somebody who doesn't even know you exist. So the stages over here are, you have to tell that person that you exist, then you have to tell them that you have got this product, which is going to serve his need. And third level, you have to tell them that, listen, my product is actually better than the other products that you're getting in the market. So there are three levels of convincing. Now, if somebody has already become a customer, they certainly know that you exist. They certainly know that you have a product. Now, your only thing is after they have used the product, you have to continue to convince the person that your product is better than what are the other products available in the market. So just one stage. So that is why it's a little easier over there. Okay, um, let's move on to the next bit, which is about niche. I'll do it this way. I think we are having a little bit of a problem. I'll just keep it off. I'll just uh, do it this way in case you're fine with it. I'll, uh, I'm having a little bit of a problem in configuring my windows. So I'll do it this way. So niche. So what do you understand when I say niche? Okay. Yes, Shivam, a strata of the society. Targeting a particular segment of the audience. Yes, yes, specific. Okay. Amethyst, I just saw uh, the problem that you had. We will get to it. We will get to it in a while. Okay, Nashua, I think I like your definition over here. A very narrowly defined space in the market. That is, I think, what we are going after a niche. A niche is not a segment. It's a very narrow segment in the market. It's a small set of people. And very necessarily, I would also say that those people have differentiated needs from the rest of the market. So they want things in a specific way. They have certain issues over here, which the normal market is not able to sort out. Okay, now let me ask a question. How many of you over here are left-handed? Any left-handers over here? Lakshit. Okay. Rushikesh, okay. So we are a good number of the planet. So I, I'm also left-hander, so... Um, my teachers in my primary school did not like the fact that I was a left-handed person. So they, they used to wrap me on my knuckles whenever I used to write with my left hand. So right now I am sort of adept at using both hands. <laughs> okay. Yes, Lana, that's a pretty uh, <laughs> interesting way of getting it. So, you know, this left-handed segment is pretty big. 2% of the market, 4% of the market, depending upon which publication you're reading. Um, so there's a large number of people on this planet who are left-handed and we have specialized needs. So you, uh, I cannot use my scissors. I cannot use scissors with the left hand, right? So uh, it's never going to cut straight. So similarly, there are a lot of other small little things where I am at a disadvantage because I am a left-handed person, right? Uh, Sanjot, I completely agree with you. The narrower the niche, the more is the chance that your business is going to be successful. Now, let me show you one particular niche, which is the left-handed one. So, 
So Lefty Store, this is in San Francisco, and they also sell online. So before online came on, it was always difficult to get all the lefties in one place. You know, it, it can be very small little things. It can be knives which are made for left-handed. It are gloves which are made for the left-handed people. Uh, it is spatulas which are for left-handed. And of course, scissors I was already talking about. But you can't take it all the way. You can't have a chess set which is designed for left-handers. So. The idea is that right now we have technology, in this case the net, which allows us to access those niches. You can go to forums, you can go to sub forums like subreddits, uh, you can go and ask the, uh, the right questions on Quora. You can identify your niche very well and reach out to them. And that allows you to sell better. That is what is the advantage of being in a niche. So in addition to this, let me talk about a few other niches which have really impressed the way they have uh, impressed me in terms of the way they have done things. So another niche which has done extremely well is Baby Gear Lab. Baby Gear Lab is this small little site which evaluates, reviews um, all the goods that you end up buying for babies from baby seats to uh, specific uh, feeding uh, feeders to uh, strollers, all of these things are reviewed over here and uh, they have articles on usage of various things that are, are possible. So a lot of parental advice is also given out um, and, and they have just branched out a little bit. They are not just on babies, they have also gone on to a little bit about pregnancy. So what has happened over here is they are able to get a large audience onto the website because they know that this is a very, very specific uh, site which is about the needs. So they go here and they can actually end up finding what they're looking for. In fact, if you look at many of the successes now, you are seeing um, a lot of niche players which are able to do well. Nika is one I just talked about. In an era when Amazon is completely flooding everybody else, they are just mashing everybody in there. When Nika has actually stood up, they end up selling largely cosmetics and wellness products and uh, only to women and they do a great job at selling a lot and they are more than just viable in fact they're very they are far more profitable than amazon is in the same market that they operate in okay um let me give you some more examples have any of you heard of the name hona h-o-h-n-e-r One of my favorite examples, I love that example. Anyone? Yes, Ajay, so what do they do? Mobile, no, uh, it would be a good mobile brand probably, uh, but no, it's not, not Rishikesh. So Ajay, what does Honor do? Yes, Arlene, music instruments for sure. Uh, they have a bunch of musical instruments. There's one which accounts for most of the, not exactly guitar, there's one particular musical instrument which dominates the sales that they have, which is what we know as the harmonica, the mouth organ. This is the product that accounts for a good 80, 85% of the sales, actually 90 plus percent of the sales. And they have a, stranglehold on this market. For professional grade harmonicas, Honor owns 80% of the worldwide market. They are dominant in this space. So you can just go up to a stage. If there's somebody who's playing a harmonica or, uh, or let's say a mouth organ, you're almost sure that that person is using a Honor. That is how dominant they are in this particular market. Okay. Um, now we get into another one. You know, there is this company called MedicBleep. When you had Slack, when you have Basecamp, you have Asana, you have all these other project management slash communication software, uh, um, or you can say packages, and all of these are uh, jostling for space in the world. And uh, some of them are doing a great job also of finding their own space in the world. MedicBleep 
launched and they are doing extremely well. What they have done is they have decided to concentrate only on the hospital market. I wouldn't even say even the medical market. This is like the hospital and clinic market. What they do is in a clinic, or a hospital, you have very specific, uh, we have very, very specific way in which teams coordinate with each other. You know, the, the unit of query is actually a patient. So this is very much a patient management system which they are doing through a system which has been popularized by uh, Asana or a Slack or a Basecamp. And they're extremely popular, one of the fastest growing, um, you can say, products in the market right now, and they're doing very well. Okay, uh, when you're talking about early adapters, early adapters are those who are willing to um, overlook some of the problems that might be there in the product, as long as they are the ones who end up using it before others. They have a higher need for that product, that's why they end up using it. But in the case of niche, it is not that they are the early adopters. They can probably come in later also. They might have other reluctances that make them, uh, make, it more, uh, make them come on board a little later. But they have a very well-specified set of needs and their needs are very different from that of the rest of the market. That is how you distinguish a niche from the rest of the market. Okay, Rohan, this is... Uh, Engineering technology Vikas, yes, I'll give you some, uh, Dr. Vikas, I'll give you some examples. And Rohan, just hold on to this one. I have an, uh, I have something that I want to say about this. Remind me before we end the session. Okay. Um, medic bleep is one example that I gave you. And then I'm talking about osmosis. This is one of the fastest growing um, ed tech companies in the world. So what do they do? They are focused only on medical education. So their uh, subscribers are medical students and they can probably end up taking a course on, for example, low calorie sweeteners, for example, uh, skin-based allergies. So they have these kind of modules which they give and their primary market is uh, medical students. But lately, they have been getting another uh, market segment and that's doing very well for them, is um, actually general, uh, general people in the market are also coming in. So th what they have done is they started with a niche, but now they found that they are appealing to the general market also. Suppose, for example, there is a certain affliction in the family or there is a certain illness in the family and uh, you would want to uh, find out more about it and you would want the, to make sure that you are able to cure the people who have that particular affliction or at least know what the doctor is talking about. So in that case, Osmosis has been able to make a for it. And yes, so I think they have their own YouTube channel also, which is on medical education. Okay, um, Dr. Vikas, I did not prepare any specific uh, engineering uh, oriented examples. One of the examples I can think of is, uh, you know, when you, uh, there were these four guys who decided that we want to quit our job with G and let's go ahead and let's start our own little enterprise. So they started their own enterprise and uh, this was in Chennai uh, in India and they could have gone on with any kind of medical robot but they decided not to go ahead with that. They decided that if we go ahead with the same kind of medical robots which GE was trying to sell, we are in direct competition with GE and we will not be able to withstand that. So what we'll do is let us find a small little niche that we can go for. So they decided to come up with products which were suitable for oncologists, those who were, uh, who were into cancer treatment. And they went only for that. And they were able to develop products which are appreciated by that particular market. And they have been able to grow a huge market for themselves. The company's name is Perfint 
and it's probably one of the leading players now in niche medical equipment. Uh, CLTV and CSC, if we have time, we'll uh, address it. It's a pretty big topic, but if we have time, we'll certainly address it. So just quickly, I'll go through the uh, advantages of uh, operating on a niche. If you are operating in a niche, you as a venture, don't spread yourself out very thinly. You can find ways in which you are able to target your audience and go after them. You don't need to go here, then everywhere. Your marketing spent is extremely well focused. Um, because you have a small group of people, you can easily identify who are going to be your potential customers. And yes, you need to become an expert. Not just that it is easier to, you really need to become an expert unless you think of yourself as an expert and your customer, more importantly, your customer thinks of yourself as an expert. It becomes difficult for you to sell in that particular market. And it's a niche. If it is a niche, people know each other very well. If they know each other very well, they are willing to communicate. Referrals become easier. The sad part is that if you are going wrong also, it becomes easier for people to talk about it. The more unique you are, the less the competition is. That is always so. And once you have been able to latch on to a niche, the niche is going to be a little more loyal to you than the rest of the generalized market. So you're going to get a lot of repeat business too. Okay. One of the biggest things which concerns people who have started off with a niche is, uh, isn't it very restrictive? Will I be able to grow after that? I'm not going to be able to become the next uh, Amazon of the world, or I'm not going to become the next Google of the world. I'm going to stay very, very small. That's not a bad thing. You know, first of all, if you have about a hundred million dollars in venture capital, then this conversation is not valid for you. Go ahead, try for the general market. But if you don't have that, then you have to go for the niche. You have to try for that small little bit of market, which the bigger guy is going to ignore because it's not important enough for them. And you're going to be able to do that. So uh, for example, okay, I talked about the single biggest bully in the world. So we, I talked about Google. Google is number one when it comes to, um, when it comes to search, but there are niches which have done well also. Um, Again, we have the geographical niches, Yandex and Rambler in um, Russia do very well. And of course we have Baidu, which dominates China for a variety of reasons, but anyway, they do dominate China, right? So other than these, which are the non Anglo-Saxon um, search engines, uh, we have some other search engines who have also done well. Obviously we have Bing, which is the number two, Yahoo, which is still around actually. It is still number three. It's been there for a long time and it's still there. It's not gone away. But there are two new search engines which have uh, been launched in the recent past and they are doing extremely well. Um, any idea? Anyone knows them? Yes, Lana, and uh, in a niche, you are always going to be able to easily charge a premium. Motesham, yes, DuckDuckGo. DuckDuckGo decided that I don't want to share my data with any commercial enterprise. I want privacy to be the main thing that I'm going to sell out of my search engine. And DuckDuckGo right now is number four in the world when it comes to search engines. They don't have a huge billion dollar turnover, but still they're making an enormous amount of money uh, if you consider the fact that it was actually made by two guys out of a small little room and it continues being more or less that it's not actually anything more anymore. Yeah. And Shivam, you're right. So the Tor browser, the dot onion project, which everybody uh, talks about the dark net, as we know it, the Tor, uh, the Tor browser has chosen Dr. Go as their, in, as their search engine of choice, big one. Gibiru, I'm not very aware of. Mozilla has a search engine? Uh, so, uh, you mean to say Mozilla has chosen Dr. Go as, uh, as the search engine of choice? I didn't know that. Wow, yeah. So uh, Dr. Go is growing, uh, going great places now. 
So there's another one. I forget the name right now, but they have a very unique way of uh, portraying their uh, expertise in search. So what they say is, we are a nonprofit. The money you give us is going to go towards planting trees. And uh, they, are a, uh, they have a huge following in the, um, you can say the eco-conscious. Like also Alta Vista, they're still around Dogpile and Metacrawler, they're also there. These two are also uh, there, but they have very little market share now. I think uh, number four, as I said, was DuckDuckGo. Number five, I'm missing the name. I'm just forgetting the name. Uh, it's this very uh, eco-conscious um, search engine that they have. So whatever, Ecosia. Yes, exactly, Lana. I'm, thank you for helping me out. Ecosia is the one. It's based out of Germany. They donate 80% of them, or rather spend 80% of their total connections on uh, planting trees and afforestation. And uh, they have a very loyal following among all the green customers that are there in the world. Yippee is doing well, absolutely, it's doing well. But I think it is, uh, uh, in the English speaking world, uh, these are the top five that I talked about. Might be, um, might be, I might be wrong also, but I think that the, the, the ones that I talked about are there. Okay, so, um, what I mean to say is you can start with a niche, but that's not the end of the game. There are a lot of things you can do after that. Let me give you three different ways in which you can go in a different path after you have decided to start with a niche. One, you can continue in the niche. Any of you have heard about Foodjoy, the product? What does it do? Yes, Lanayan, tell me, what do they do? Exactly. So, Footjoy is the world's leader when it comes to golf shoes. Yes, sure, it's golf shoes. They do golf shoes better than anybody else. Golf shoes have their own specific requirements. You need traction, and uh, now you need the traction without the spikes. So that makes it very difficult. Obviously, you need to waterproof it because uh, there's usually a lot of water on the course. The grass has been watered, so you need to be waterproof. And you need it to be light. There's a guy who's going to be walking seven kilometers in the shoes. And if we see what the American president looks like, and if we imagine other golfers to be like him, probably we don't have very healthy people walking those seven kilometers in those shoes. So we need shoes which are lightweight, comfortable, waterproof, and give you good traction. So all these things put together is a very challenging combination and Foodjoy has been figuring out how to do that well. So others have been challenging Foodjoy. Nike came out with golf shoes in the 80s. 90s, they made a huge play. We want to dominate the world of golf shoes. We are going to beat Footjoy. That is what they came in. Adidas became interested. Wow, so these guys are going into golf shoes. Let me also get into golf shoes. Adidas got into golf shoes. These guys battled it out for the next 20, 25 years. And then finally, about seven, eight years back, both of them said that, no, we can't win. Nike got out of it. They've decided to stop the business completely. Adidas, what they did was they went out and bought one of the strong competitors that Foodjoy had, which was TaylorMade. So TaylorMade became an Adidas brand, and uh, but they as themselves just could not make any foray in this entire place. So uh, you can continue in the niche. Other interesting thing is multi niche. So if your niche is good, try to see if there's any other niche which also needs the same product as your original niche. So Blackboard was a accounting ERP kind of a software which was being used by a lot of NGOs, non-government organizations, non-profits were using it. And then they found that, okay, um, I think another group of people who can use our product is actually education institutions. So they went in over there and they are doing reasonably very well over there too. So they have gone into two or three different niches. Another interesting one, uh, it is Black BAUD board. Uh, not the blackboard, which is the LMS, which uh, probably is the dominant LMS right now. This started off as a ERP software for uh, the nonprofit sector. There are some educational institutions which use it. It doesn't have an LMS function. 
it uh, does have an accounting and enterprise uh, uh, function. Um, another interesting strategy over here is you have a lot of niche players who went from being a niche player to being somebody who is well thought of in the general segment. So any of you have heard about um, North Face? Yeah, a very sneaky one. Yes. So a clothing brand, North Face is a clothing brand. They are they're actually a pretty old brand. They started in the 1950s. It started off as a small shop and they were selling mountaineering and trekking equipment. Later on, more uh, concentrating on the clothes. They had a good following in that particular segment. In fact, if you go to Nepal right now, you'll find that um, there are more knockoffs for um, North Face than there are for Nike, Adidas and Puma put together. So it is very much uh, a brand which appeals to a specific segment, which is um, outdoors, high altitude trekking, mountaineering, those kind of things. But now they have come out with clothes which are worn by rappers, which are worn by people who have probably not seen the outside of a city. They live their entire life in a city. It's even worn by those. So they have broadened the appeal of what they do. Similarly, Billabong. They went from being a brand which was only for surfers to becoming a beachwear brand. And now, of course, they are also having casual clothing which has come out. Absolutely. So you are not stuck at a place because of what you started off doing. There are places that you can actually go to after you have established your link in the uh, niche. Now, um, the third thing that I wanted to talk to you about is you've gotten over the reluctance that you, uh, your customers had, you have decided that you want to go in for a niche, but next is you need to have an idea of what kind of business you are, what kind of uh, size that uh, market size that actually is there for you. So it all starts off with how much are you going to take from a customer for a, a single transaction and uh, that also determines what is going to be the total volume of money that you're going to pay. So I've just given you some examples of how you reach a million dollar, how you reach to be a million dollar company. If you're selling potato chips, you'll just sell a lot many more than let us say if you're trying to sell houses and you want to have a million dollars. So the idea over here is to tell you that there are several ways of skinning the cat. There are a lot of ways in which you can become a million dollar company. You have to decide which one it is that suits you. And, um, and again, the margins are going to be different. So that is again something that you have to look at and be very careful. I mean, we have got into the habit of looking at a macro picture and we sometimes forget the micro picture that exists over here. Uh, what I mean by the micro picture is, um, you know, the market sizing should never be that there are about 100,000 families in the city and I'm going to try to get only about 2% of them, that is 2,000 families. It's not going to be difficult at all. You should go about it the other way. You say that, okay, the families which need me the most are those that have at least one member which is commuting for a minimum of three hours in a day. So let us find how many such families there are. Okay, my job is to find the first hundred such families and market only to them. And which will be the best way to, for me to reach them? Let me figure that out. Is it going to be through a Facebook page? Is it going to be through a outdoor ad which is near the busiest station in the city? Let me figure out which is the cheapest way to reach them. So you have to do it bottom up. The top-down approach to uh, your market size is something which is easy to do, but is not a valid exercise unless you've done it bottom-up also. So the difference between these two is when you're doing top-down, you're using a lot of dividing. So 100,000 families, the top 10% uh, in terms of income would be 10,000, so divide by 10. Out of those, those which have got a minimum of six members would be uh, another five, uh, about 5%. So we bring it down to 500 families. Okay, and those which live close to the city center will be another 10% of those. So we come to 50. So you are coming from dividing, 
whereas bottom up is a multiplication so you have you have found 10 people in this particular uh, housing area who have this issue so let us go to five housing areas so we go 10 into 5 so we are likely to find 50 such families but first let's do that so that's the way you build up your market it's always bottom up which is going to be more effective than top down okay so one hour of my talk is through uh, what we have to do after here is i'm open to questions there are some questions which i have not been able to answer i have sort of left it for a while uh, so those questions again i'll end up taking again right now okay uh, first is parminder is it certain that a business can decay if we try to please all market segments I wouldn't like to say it is certain, but I would say that the possibility is very huge that it will end up decaying if you're trying to satisfy everybody. Also, identifying our niche does us a huge favor to our clients because it's ultimately solving it. Absolutely. If you have identified a niche and you're gunning for that niche, that just means that you are more focused on them than anybody else. So your products are going to be better for them than for the rest of the general market. Yes, any other questions that we have uh, on what we have done so far today? How to identify a niche? Uh, yeah, Sanjot, yes, it's not a cliche thing. It's a pretty, it's actually a difficult thing. I mean, uh, and uh, I, I think there are answers to it, but I don't know whether the answers are satisfactory or not. Let me take a very relevant recent example that we are talking about. Uh, if we talk about the various problems that we have had uh, because of COVID, uh, one of the issues is uh, looking at uh, delivery. You know, uh, ultra high safety delivery whom do we actually go and deliver food in a way that is made in a very hygienic way and the delivery itself is done in a manner that completely eliminates any way of the virus uh, uh, passing on to somebody else uh, this is actually a service which got started right now it's a premium service and they try to identify who exactly it is that they are going to target it towards. So what they did was, who are the people, obviously everybody wants it, but who are the people who want it most? That is the question they went on asking. Okay, do they want it more? No, let's find out the people who are completely uh, facing a problem which is exactly of this nature and they want it more than anybody else that we can think of. So ultimately they have decided that this is going to be a delivery service which is meant only for senior citizens. As we know by now that COVID is something which is more likely to hit senior citizens and also is a little more harmful for them. So they deserve and they need some extra protection. And this company has come up with a protocol which makes it far more safer for them to receive packaged foods. Okay. Um, Atelang, uh, can the niche and the early adopters be the same? Uh, sometimes you can use one of the niches or sub niches as the early adapters or rather a large number of your early adapters can come from within the niche. That is how usually a lot of people end up doing it. If our niche, there, is many, there are many competitors, should we consider the niche and start working on that? Now, if there are too many competitors within a niche, get out of it. You really don't want to operate over there. Um, for example, there are some uh, sports niches which are extremely well occupied. You don't want to get into that. For example, TT has Tiga, has uh, Butterfly, has Tag, has um, GKI. You have a lot of very specialized brands which go only for that particular niche. I think you should get out of that. You should find a niche where the competition is far lesser. Market research, yes. 
but I'm not a very big believer market. I think market research ends up, ends up giving us incomplete and sometimes even wrong answers. I would think that one of the best ways of going about it is uh, you should actually look at, um, you know, you, you, you try to find the best way that you can actually hit the niche, which uh, go to the market, ask a lot of people directly, open-ended questions, not close-ended. Yes, Rohan, thank you. Uh, you've, it's easy to knock off an innovative product, but an innovative business system is much harder to replicate. Okay. Um, I would try to see that the replicability of something can be difficult. If it's an innovative product, then its replicability is limited only by the patents you have surrounding it. But if it is an innovative business system, you need to have a lot other competencies you build in so that you can actually replicate it. Unless you have those competencies, you'll not be able to replicate it. That is why it is a little more difficult, in my opinion. Okay. What's an unfair advantage? Is it a requirement for a niche business? So unfair advantage, if you're getting the word from the Lean Canvas, um, you don't need to make it an unfair advantage when you're early on in the business, but you need to make sure that your understanding of the niche is superior than that of the other competitors. Your focus on that niche is superior from that of the other competitors. I think that's a good start, Ralph. I mean, after that, you can go on to something else. How to know or find our potential customers who pay for our services and products in our niche? If you're meeting somebody's needs, important needs, better than others in the market, that is your niche and that is where you're going to end up doing well. Evangeline, uh, you are a high-end furniture decor business uh, I presume you have found your niche, niche, yes. Should I stick to the present type of my niche despite the pandemic crisis? How can I lower the level of my clientele uh, so I can be still be in business during the crisis? Angeline, I think you are on a good wicket over here. I think it might have just been a temporary uh, stop in the flow. But I think the high-end furniture and decor business is not going away. Right now, there are people who are feeling the financial crunch a little bit. That's why there's been a temporary uh, lull in the market. But nowadays, what has happened is a lot more people are spending a lot more time in their homes. So I think that there's going to be a demand uh, surge very quickly. Uh, Tibo, uh, what we are looking at is uh, uh, what you're looking at is a venture which is into uh, musicians or is it something else which is uh, in music that is of interest to you? Musicians, yes. I think, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody who wants to set up an online gig platform for musicians. So what I told him is the first thing that you should end up doing is find out 50 people who are going to be musicians on your platform and give them a reason to be on the platform without having many customers uh, who are going to be taking their uh, gigs from them in the early days because you are not going to get the customers. The customers are going to come after a lag. So you have to make it interesting enough for them. Provide them something else, run events for them, give them some freebies, make sure that they stay on the pra platform and then you can see how you want to take them. Mohammed Umar, we are launching a six-month program on entrepreneurship out of our new NCR campus. And um, we want to take in people who are interested in entrepreneurship and who have got a good, um, uh, and we, uh, within the six months, we want to actually get them a full-fledged venture, incubate them, and that's when the program will come to an end also. Harshit, how can 
Okay. Okay, Vijaya. The last question I will take is from Harshit. Sure, How sure, can sure. we get to know about the market problems worth solving? If there is a problem, it's worth solving. But you have to find a problem. That is the big one. Shambhavi, let me just quickly see what is the question that you have put down over here. I'm sorry I didn't go to those. I'll just take that one over here. Market price is a big question. You have to look at what is the alternate cost for the customer and you have to stay within the alternate cost for the customer. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think we'll uh, stop it at here. Any of you who want to get in touch with me can uh, get in touch with me at uh, Royrajiv at gmail.com. Uh, my blog is jeev.blog, but um, I have uh, taken off my blogs, uh, my blog postings for just now. Um, I want to redo a few things. I have been talking about all non business things for a while. So I'm going to take it off and I'm going to redo my blog. So uh, my blog will be active again in another four days' time, but uh, email, it's active. Really nice to have all of you and thank you very much for spending time with us uh, and thank you Vijaya for giving me this opportunity to have an interaction with all of you. you well much. Rajiv, it has been really a pleasure having you today with us and uh, students have thoroughly learned so much I'm sure. It's not only them, even I am taking away a lot from this webinar. So it has been fantastic and I have small announcement to make to the attendees before we wrap up and I end the meeting. I have shared two links in the chat window and we have come up with a mentorship app. So you can download it from the Play Store and you can register. If you're a faculty, you can register as an advisor. And if you are an entrepreneur, you can have customized mentorship from mentors across the world that we have on the app. So kindly make use of it. The link is there. I'll post it again for you and also do share your feedbacks with us. That will help us improvise. And with that note, I'll thank you, Rajiv. I'll let you go now. Thank you, Vijaya. Very long session for you. And thank you so much for coming over and thank spending you. your time thank with you. us. Anything. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.